What is up guys, it's High on Life back here with another video today, and today we're going to be talking about commonly confused cars. Now, this list is mostly going to be from my personal experience and experience from those around me that have had confusion with these models or these different cars, but without further ado, let's get on to the video. Now the first two cars that we have on this list are going to be the S14 Kuki and the S14 Zinki. And you may be saying to yourself, well Scion, aren't they the same car? They're both Nissan 240SXs. And yes, you are correct. They're both S14 240SXs. But the difference is going to be purely in the design. And this is why they get confused so often. So the S14 Zinke is the earlier model and it's going to feature more rounded headlights compared to the Kuki model, which is the later model that features sharper and more aggressive headlights. And this is pretty much the only difference as mechanically, there is very little, if any at all, differences in between the two, but this is also part of the reason why they're so commonly confused because it's really just the headlights and that's the only way that you can tell the difference between these two. Now coming in as the second entry on this list we have the Shelby Mustang GT350 and the Shelby Mustang GT500 but not the modern ones. We're going to be talking about the 1967 model year which was the very first year that the GT500 came out and it was one of the last years the GT350 was in production here. And so there are quite a few differences. It'll be a little bit easier to tell between the S4, the two S14s, but the differences are going to come first off in the engine. So the GT350 came with a 306 horsepower 289 Windsor engine, and this was Ford's strongest Mustang 289 that year. And the GT500 this year was packed with a heavy but very powerful 428, which was capable of generating 330, 355 horsepower. Now, the really the main difference is going to become the track focus nature of the GT350 compared to the GT500 here. And since the GT350 was more race car oriented, it was less luxurious less comfortable and it was more designed for track use both in the suspension and the gearing than was its brother the GT500 which was kind of more of a powerful cruiser for the road. And now the next entry on this list is one that I personally get confused a lot and I know that a lot of other people get confused as well and it's going to be the Datsun 240Z, 260Z, and 280Z. So on this entry we're going to have three cars instead of just two. So let's start off with the 240 and the 280. What's the difference here? So they're both going to share identical bodies so the body lines are going to be the same there are no design features that are different between these two cars. The only difference that you're going to be able to find are going to be very small things like the badging, the blinkers, and other, you know, just very minute details like that that you can tell them apart if you're a real fair lady enthusiast. But to the normal person, it's going to be very difficult to distinguish between the two. And later on in this part, I will get to how you actually can a lot easier but let's start now going on to the 260Z. The 260Z shares nearly everything on the outside as well, but obviously the differences between the 240Z and the 280Z are going to be the same with the 260Z, which is going to be badges, blinkers, and other small things like that, you know, a little headlight difference. But the 280Z overseas, the way you can tell this one apart, if you are overseas in Europe, Australia, Asia, is that it came in a 2 plus 2 which looks a lot different than the standard two seaters that the other two models came in as you're gonna have two front seats two back seats so they had to create a bit more room in the car for the 280Z 2 plus 2 but now let's get down to where you're really going to be able to tell the difference between these three cars so starting off with the 240Z it came with a 2.4 liter i6 which is going to be the smallest variation of this engine, the L24. And moving on to the 260, it came with a 2.6 liter 
L26 in line 6 motor. You can kind of see the pattern here of where it's going with the naming and uh, the leader size of the motors. And so the 280Z came with a 2.8 liter L28E I6 engine, which is going to be the most powerful variation of this platform. But if you can get the owner to pop the hood, that's the main way you're going to be able to tell the difference between the 240, the 260, and the 280. So now moving on to the fourth entry on this list, we have the E36 and E46 M3s. You may be thinking to yourself, well, Scion, I already know the differences between these two cars. Well, I do see a lot of people, especially on the internet, a bunch of young car enthusiasts, that actually don't know the difference. And they'll say, oh, bro, nice E46 M3, whenever it's an E36 in a video or the picture or whatever it is. And so I just want to clear this up a little bit. So starting off with the engine, the E36 was offered with a 2.8 liter, 185 horsepower engine. And then getting on into the E46's engine, it got a big boost in power whenever it was launched, and it got a 3 liter, still a 6 cylinder motor, but it made 225 horsepower. And moving on to another difference in between these two cars, if you get into the inside, on the E36, they only had front airbags for the driver and the passenger. This was mainly due to regulations at the time. But at the turn of the century, they had new regulations, of course, new safety features. And so if you get into an uh, E46 or E36, and you don't know the difference in between the two, but you know it's an M3, and you, know, you look and you see the front airbags, but you don't see side curtain airbags that were added in the E46, then you know that you're sitting in an E36. Now let's get into a bit of the differences that are more uh, performance-based. So the E36 was a lot lighter than the E46, and this may make you think, well, with only a 40 horsepower difference between the two, that means the E36 was a better car, right? Well, not really, because the E46, although it was heavier, this was due to, of course, a better interior, nicer electronics, you know, nicer options on the car. Uh, it did have a stiffer chassis, which makes it better for drifting, and you will see a lot of E46s in drifting. You'll see some E36s as well, but it's more predominantly uh, dominated by the E46 generation of M3s. And so another reason uh, that the E46 could be told apart from the E36, as you can see by the pictures on the screen, it's that the E46 had a lot newer styling. It was a turn of the century car and styling changed, you know, by manufacturers. And so it was a bit more streamlined, it was a bit more modern, both on the interior and on the exterior as well. So that is another way you can tell those two apart. And coming in as the final addition on this list, we have the Porsche 911 models. And this one's a little bit more broad. I just wanted to kind of variate between the different trims of the 911 more so than getting into depth with the generations because I really could make a whole video talking about 911 generations. But we're going to start here with the Carrera. So this is going to be the base model 911. It's going to have the weakest motor, uh, the least uh, race-oriented suspension. It's going to be more suited for a daily driver. You know, you're just a business guy and you want something sporty that you can also take to work. You can take your kid to soccer or whatever. You want to get the Carrera. Now, if you want to get a bit of a bump up in performance here, you're going to get the Carrera S, which is a more powerful model of the Carrera. I think they usually make around 40 or 50 more horsepower, and they're going to be suited with better options such as rear axle steering, you know, better interior. They may come with a different transmission, but that's going to be the main differences between those two. So jumping up to the big boys here we're going to be talking about next is the turbo, which as the name implies, it comes with a turbocharged engine. Now the Porsche 911 Carrera to the Porsche 911 Turbo is going to see a huge jump in power to the turbo model. That's going to be the main difference between those two models. 
So now we have the Turbo S, which is a step up from the Turbo. It's not necessarily going to make more power than the Turbo Trim, but it is going to have better options. It's going to be better suited for either comfort or track, whichever you choose to option it as. And now we can move on to the real big boys in Porsche's lineup. So starting here with the GT3, this is essentially a Porsche Turbo, and they're going to always have similar uh, 0 to 60 times, similar speed, similar top speed, similar horsepower, but the difference is the GT3 is going to have a way better suspension, and it's going to have way better times around the track. And this is going to be the little brother to the well-known GT3 RS, which is going to be the most track-focused, naturally aspirated model that Porsche is going to come up with with the generation that it's in. And this is going to be the one that's going to really set the big Nürburgring time. It's going to carry the very hefty price tag, and it's going to usually be the most desirable car. But in recent models, uh, namely the 997, 991, 992 generations, they have started making a GT2 RS. And what this does, it improves upon the GT3 RS platform, which is already great for the track, and it adds twin turbos to the motor. And this just really sets it apart from every other car in Porsche's lineup. It has beaten a ton of great cars around the Nürburgring. I believe it currently holds the record. I could be wrong. There could be another car that beat it out recently. But for now, I do believe it holds the record around the Nürburgring for fastest time. So this is going to be, it's going to carry the highest price tag. And I believe this is the only car in the 911 lineup that is going to be considered a supercar. And as you go up from the Carrera to the GT2 RS itself, they're going to have different badges on the back. But if you just see one driving by you on the highway or coming from the other direction down the road, the way you can tell is usually by how ridiculously aggressive it looks. Because with the Carrera, it's going to look more tame, more just like, you know, just your average car. It's still a Porsche, but it's going to look more like a normal car that you see on the road working all the way up to the GT2 RS with the super aggressive fender vents and the huge wing and just all the good stuff. And I want to do more videos later on specifying between different classic muscle cars and the specific 911 generations and etc. But I just don't have enough time in one video to really go through it and explain it. So I would like to do videos later on explaining the differences in between those. But if there are any cars that you would have liked to see me explain or would like to see me explain in a future video, let me know down in the comments below. And there are tons, I know that there are tons of more cars and generations I could have put into this video. So if you really do have a suggestion for me, put it down and you know I'll write it down and I'll make a video on it later on. But thank you for watching, and I hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure to leave a like, and if you did enjoy the video, please consider subscribing and following along for more content like this. But for now, this is Scion Life, signing in.